Okay, good afternoon and welcome back everyone to our Options Education Webinar Series. My name is Tony Zhang. I'm the Chief Strategist here at Options Play. And today we're here to talk about the optimal option strategies for options on futures. Uh, uh, last month, we introduced the concept of trading options on futures, is, which we discussed is quite similar in nature to options on equities such as stocks or ETFs, but there are some differences that you have to be aware of. Um, and specifically, we introduced the small exchange options on futures, which are standardized to a way that mimics equity and, and ETF options. So for everyone that's viewing this here today, if you're familiar with trading stock and ETF options, trading options on futures, especially at the small exchange, is a fairly easy transition. So today what we want to dive is a little further into the actual strategies that you could trade using these options on futures and how you can really maximize some of the advantages that you have with trading options on futures versus trading options on stocks or ETFs, especially when you are looking at similar underlyings, um, whether it's the US dollar, whether it's precious metals, um, the uh, efficiencies that you get with uh, options on futures can provide some additional um, benefits. So today we're going to discuss what strategies will maximize those benefits, what the data shows us in terms of why these strategies work, and then show you some examples of how you can implement these strategies with some real trading examples. So let's go ahead and get started. But before we do what we are going to discuss here today is purely for education and demonstration purposes. It is not a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell any of the specific securities that we are going to discuss during today's session. So what we're going to start off with are, is talking about, first of all, implied versus realized volatility. This is an important concept to understand as an options trader in general, but is specifically uh, useful for the strategies that we are going to discuss here today. And the spread between the implied versus the realized volatility is what we call the volatility risk premium. And we're going to talk about how to trade this volatility risk premium and use it to our advantage based on the underlying data. We'll take a look at the strategies that uh, we'll, that we're going to refer to here today, uh, some of the back testing results and the data that shows why these strategies are profitable in the long run. We'll take a look at the volatility data that supports this specific trading strategy. And then we'll look at some trading examples using uh, some uh, real uh, world um, examples during today's session. And then we'll open this up for Q&A here at the very end. But the primary thing that I want you to be able to walk away from today's session is a clear understanding as to what are the optimal option strategies specifically for trading options on futures. And we'll talk a little bit about what are the differences between options on equities, such as stocks or ETS versus futures, and what advantages you might have and how to take advantage of those advantages using these specific option strategies. So first, before we jump into that, I do want to introduce the concept of implied versus realized volatility. These are two important volatility metrics to understand because realized volatility refers to the actual volatility of the underlying instrument that you're trading. Implied volatility refers to what is the market's expectation for the future volatility of that underlying. So Realized volatility is something that we calculate from historical prices. So how volatile has the specific underlying uh, been in the past? And then implied volatility is calculated from options prices. It effectively backs out what the options market is implying as to what the expected future volatility of an underlying security is going to be. So this is important because the... Realized volatility is the actual movement that occurs over a defined past period, and it is influenced simply by the rate of change of the underlying security. So whether the stock or, or, or security that we're looking at moves up or down at a relatively fast rate, does so at a relatively mild rate, or doesn't move at all, that's what determines how volatile the underlying um, asset is. So if you think about things like currencies, these are the, some of the least volatile um, asset classes in the world. Currencies simply don't move very much simply because there's so much in circulation. It takes such a large uh, amount of capital to move those markets versus 
you know, you think about something more like a biotech stock that actually isn't particularly liquid, doesn't take much for a biotech stock, you know, some news to come out, some some type of um, clinical study for it to move massive amounts over a very short period of time. So what you're really considering is what is the underlying that you're trading and how likely it is going to be vol vol volatile. Um, and there's a pretty wide range depending on the asset class that you're trading. So that really depends on just generally speaking, uh, the security itself and how heavily it's traded, because that's going to determine the volatility, if you will, of the underlying security. Versus when you look at implied volatility, what we're looking at is the supply and demand of the options market of that underlying security. So as options are bought, what you have is our options premiums that become more elevated and IV uh, implied volatilities naturally will become elevated as option buyers step in or more buyers step in than sellers and vice versa. If there are more sellers of an option, what, what's happening is that uh, implied volatility will become suppressed. Because if you think about it, when there's a lot of buyers of an option, that means that there are uh, market participants that believe that the stock is or, or the equity or the underlying that you're trading is going to make a big move, right? That's why you buy an option. You buy a call or a put because you think that the, the underlying is going to make a big move either higher or lower. And the more buyers there are of options, the more ex the more the higher the, the future expected uh, volatility is going to be. Vice versa, if there are a lot of sellers of options, uh, meaning more sellers than buyers, what that reflects is the market's view that the security is not going to move very much because that's when you that's when you sell calls or that's when you sell puts is you believe that the that the underlying asset is not going to move as much so you become uh, sellers and as and that is how the market in, implies if you will what the future expected volatility of the market is so these are two very important concepts to understand one is what has the, what has the security done or in the past and what is the market's expected future uh, volatility of the underlying does that make sense in terms of the difference please type one into the chat window if that makes sense to you it's an important concept to understand with respect to trading options in general but more important even for the specific strategies that we're going to discuss here today. And we're going to look at some of the underlying data between implied versus realized and the relationship that they have between the two, because it is important for this trading strategy. So before we kind of dive into some of the volatility data, I want to talk a little bit about the difference between trading options on a futures contract versus options on a stock or ETF. So most viewers here are probably familiar with trading options on stocks or ETFs. Uh, you know, these are individual companies or ETFs or funds. Um, futures, uh, you are many times trading more, uh, you know, uh, asset classes. You're not trading individual stocks or individual companies, but what you have access to is capital efficiency. So stocks or ETFs give you access to individual companies, Futures give you access to what we call capital efficiency. And today, what we're going to spend most of our time understanding is really this one aspect, which is span margining versus regula regulation T margining. Um, and this is, I would say, from in the context of what we are discussing here today, is going to be the biggest difference or advantage that you have with trading options on futures versus trading options on a very similar ETF. You know, you, we have uh, futures contracts that are tied to gold. You have ETF tied to gold. You have futures contracts tied to the U.S. dollar. You have ETFs tra uh, tracking the U.S. dollar. So the underlying security are very similar in nature, but because few options on futures are based on span margining, which means that the margining process is dependent on how volatile the underlying nature of the security is, which makes a lot of sense. If you're trading something that's not very volatile, you may not, you should not have to post as much margin as if you are trading something that's far more volatile. But when you trade stocks or ETFs, unfortunately, the margining process for stocks or ETFs assumes a single uh, margining across all securities, regardless of volatility. So effectively, what you're doing is you're paying the margin requirements on the most volatile security for all securities, and that's not particularly efficient. So. We're going to see some examples here today where you're going to see some substantial benefits to selling volatility um, 
and in options on futures rather than options on stocks or ETFs. There are some other things that we should discuss, such as the fact that uh, futures trade in extended hours, there are no pattern day trading rules, and there are potential tax savings when you're trading options on futures. So if you're trading on a similar underlying and you have the choice between an ETF option and an options on future, um, not only do you have the capital efficiency from a margin perspective that's going to be important for our conversation today, there are some practical benefits such as extended trading. You don't have to deal with pattern day trading rules if you have a smaller account than $25,000, and you do have potential tax benefits if you're trading in a taxable account. So those are some of the things I covered on the session here last month. If you want to go back and review that, please go ahead and do so in terms of the differences in terms of contract. But today, we're going to focus on that margining process. Hey, I hope that you're enjoying the session so far. I would love for you to join me on my next live event where you can learn alongside thousands of traders and I'll answer your questions live. Either click on the link on your screen or check out the description below. I host weekly trading and education sessions just like this one and you'll get to trade alongside our research team's daily trading signals, weekly technical research, and access the most intuitive option strategies analytics platform free for 30 days. We're here to help you succeed and please make sure you like this video and hit the subscribe button. Thank you and let's get back to it. So let's review, let's go back to the volatility discussion. Um, so the, the difference between implied volatility and realized volatility, meaning what is the actual volatility over the period of time versus what did the market expect over that period of time? The difference between those two is what we call the volatility risk premium. And what you have here is the data is very clear across all asset classes, pretty much all asset classes, and pretty much throughout the entire history that options have been available or options data has been available, is that implied volatility has always averaged higher levels than realized volatility. What that means is that the market always seems to price future expected volatility higher than what we actually see the volatility the underlying security um, actually exhibits. Now, there's a, a ton of debate around why this is the case, but I don't think why is necessarily important. The important part is what, and the what is the fact that implied volatility has averaged higher levels than realized volatility. And we're going to talk about why this is important and what and how you can use this to your advantage. Because this, the fact that implied volatility averages a higher level than realized volatility creates what we consider a tradable advantage for short volatility options positions. Because uh, what we realize is that by the time you get to expiration, the implied, the, what is expected in terms of volatility will converge to what is the actual volatility because at expiration, the implied will become the realized. So if something is always higher than what it's going to be at expiration, you have an advantage of being short volatility or short an option versus buying an option. Because when you're buying an option, you're effectively long volatility. When you're selling an option, you're short volatility. So you have this slight edge for sellers versus buyers. And many of you may have heard over the years, maybe you've you, maybe you even do it yourself, where you, you heard, you've heard of the term that professionals generally will sell options versus buying. How many of you have heard that before? Please type two into the chat window if you've heard that concept before, that professionals prefer or will tend to sell options far more often than they buy options. And it's because of this volatility risk premium, that implied volatility is naturally going to always average a higher level than realized volatility. So there's an advantage to being short volatility than being long volatility, meaning short options versus long options. And this condition has remained true across almost every asset class. So it doesn't matter whether you're an equities trader or a currency trader, or commodities trader. Uh, if you're trading derivatives in any of these asset classes, you will find that professionals will gravitate towards selling more options than they're buying options because of this volatility risk premium. However, you know, a lot of traders will say, well, selling options have what we call short-term tail risk, right? Because when you're selling an option, you have limited gains, in, in uh, an, an unlimited risk, right? That's the disadvantage to selling options is that 
what you could potentially make is, is limited to the premium that you collect. And when you're selling an option, you're taking on the risk that this, the equity or the underlying moves against you. However, what we're going to show you is the data shows that this one strategy, despite the, uh, the negative risk to reward ratio that you have with selling options, it also provides one of the fastest recoveries to break even when you do have a drawdown or when you do have uh, you know, a, a month that's uh, a negative from a performance perspective. And that's really interesting from my perspective is that you know, one of the biggest concerns that we see retail traders um, uh, be, uh, are effectively afraid of selling options. You know, it, the recovery to back to break even is actually one of the fastest by sorting uh, option strategies rather than buying. And, and we're going to cover this here today, and especially around the strategies that have unlimited risk is usually where we see a lot of retail traders stay away from. So we're going to discuss kind of some of the modifications you, that you can make to offset that risk, but also just understand that the risk that you're assuming, you know, what that risk actually is, because it's the term unlimited certainly is scary, but I think it's it doesn't do enough justice in terms of truly helping you quantify what the risks are when you sell an option. So that's what we want to discuss here today. But does that make sense, everyone, as to why, you know, we tend to focus more on, or professionals tend to focus more on selling versus buying options because of this volatility of risk premium? If that makes sense to you, please type three into the chat window. Perfect. Okay. We see a lot of threes. So now let's take a look at some of the strategies, right? So the purest way to technically short volatility is to use a strategy like a short strangle strategy. Um, this is where you're selling an out of the money call and an out of the money put. You know, usually, you know, a shorter dated 21 to 30 day option because shorter dated options will take advantage of theta and short vega at the same time. Uh, we're usually using, a, you know, an out of the money call or a put in this particular case, a 16 delta. 16 delta refers to the one standard deviation strike price. And what you're doing is you're basically selling an out of the money strangle, hoping that the stock or the underlying will stay within that 16 delta range. And 16 delta, again, refers to one standard deviation so that you basically, as long as things remain normal or 68% of the time, what you're going to find is that the underlying will stay within that range and you collect the premium on the short strangle. And you're collecting premium on both sides because the, the underlying can only move in one direction or the other. It obviously can't move in both directions. So you're effectively doubling the premium that you're collecting because you're collecting on both sides, but you're only taking the risk on one particular side because the, the underlying, like I said, can only move either substantially lower or substantially higher if it does move against you. But you have doubled the amount of premium on both sides to offset that underlying risk that you're taking by shorting the option. Now, this is a strategy that has unlimited risk, which is why a lot of retail traders stay away from it because of that one concept. But today I want to show you just kind of how far perhaps, you know, something needs to move before you really truly see unlimited, uh, you know, some substantial risk really. And what we're going to discuss here is not only the strategy itself, but how to optimize around the strategy. And there's really two things that you can do to optimize. One is implied volatility and two is directional view. Um, you don't need this in order to be profitable because even without this, we, I'll show you the data that shows that these types of strategies are profitable, but you can greatly increase your profitability if you can optimize around these two items. One is IV rank. IV rank measures the, implied, the current implied volatility of the option relative to its own history. So the implied volatility in op, of, of, of an underlying asset <clears throat> moves and, and, and is, um, fluctuates throughout the year. Uh, and if you think about, uh, for example, equity options, uh, they tend to be elevated as you get approach and earnings expiration. Or, I'm sorry, an earnings announcement. And they tend to move towards the bottom of the range after the earnings announcement because the uncertainty is highest going into an, um, an earnings announcement. And once the earnings announcement comes out, that's when uncertainty is at its lowest. So you tend to see this range that the implied volatility trades within throughout the year. So Basically, what you want to do is you want to be selling options when it's towards the upper bound of the range. So implied volatility rank, which many platforms have, including Options Play, Tastyworks, 
uh, TD Ameritrade, uh, Schwab, you know, all of these platforms, they now have IV rank. Some have IV percentile. They're all very similar to each other. But basically, when IV rank is greater than 50%, you increase your odds of success. Basically, you're collecting more premium than average. You're collecting premiums that are greater than one standard deviation of normal. And what you're going to do is increase the premium that you collect. That's going to, uh, you know, generate more income. And it's also going to give you a bigger offset to the risk that you're taking when you're short this type of strangle. The second thing that you can do is from a directional perspective, right? You can put on a strangle at 16 delta at any time, but if let's say you have a strong directional view that because a strangle is really something that you trade when you have a neutral view on an underlying. So especially if you have, a, if you have an underlying where you believe it's trading in a range, well, you can kind of use that range to your advantage and collect a little bit more premium on one side to offset you know, some additional risk. So we'll talk about examples of this as to how you can make that adjustment from a directional perspective. But if you do have a directional view, you can add additional premium and that has the potential to profit a little bit faster and collect a higher premium. Does that make sense, everyone? Please type four into the chat window if that makes sense to you. <clears throat> and, I, and I will also add one more variation to this when we go through the examples. If you're uncomfortable taking on unlimited risk, what you can do to create a limited risk, risk strategy, but still take advantage of the concepts that we're going to discuss here today. Okay. But it's important to understand that from a pure short volatility play, a short strangle is usually the starting point of a strategy to be able to do that. Selling an out of the money call or in and out of the money put in a relatively short dated uh, options expiration. Okay. So here are some of the back testing data. And this is really, this is a, this is um, a continuous short strangle strategy on different asset classes. This is no, uh, this is not taking into account any form of directional view of the market. This is not taking into account any form of picking when are the ideal times to sell strangles, meaning when volatility is high. This is just continuously selling strangles, you know, month after month, regardless of market direction or volatility environment. And even with that, you see that you have positive return across all asset classes. And this is over about a, an eight-year time span from June to 2021, um, uh, 1994 to 2021. This was a back test done by PIMCO, um, one of the largest bond funds in the world, taking a look at, you know, just indiscriminately selling strangles in the markets on these different asset classes and the type of excess return and the type of, of risk that you're taking. And as you can see, the sharp ratios are actually quite strong across all of these. And, and again, this is a non-optimized strategy. This is just indiscriminately selling constant triangles without in any uh, optimization or understanding of volatility or market direction, which I think all of us that if we were ever to trade these types of strategies, we would not necessarily ignore that and just sell strangles outright. But even if you did, you're having excess returns and you have a very strong sharp ratio, meaning the risk adjusted returns on these are quite strong. You're taking on fairly small amounts of risk to take. Uh, you know, the returns don't look spectacular, but you're also taking on a very small amount of risk to uh, achieve those returns. And that's really, I think, what's more important than anything else is not just what returns do you have, but how much risk are you taking to take on those returns. And one of the most interesting things, and, and this is really one of the reasons why I think a lot of investors don't trade short strangles is because of this, you know, something bad could happen one month and cause you to, to see some large losses in your portfolio. And that's absolutely true. And that's exactly what they saw here is that, you know, in a single month, you tend to have losses that sometimes exceed your best possible months. And this is something that concerns most investors. But what they also saw is that if you did this over a longer period of time, meaning you're not just selling strangles for one month and going away and never doing it again, because if you did that, you do take on uh, some risk that that one month, you know, just something bad happens in the market that you have no control over. The Fed raises interest rates and equity markets decline by 20%. You had no control over that. You couldn't see that in advance. And you took on some substantial losses for the strangles that you've sold. But if you kept doing that month after month, right? One of This is one of the strategies that saw one of the fastest return back to break even 
after uh, you know what is what we call some some of a tail event, right? The tail event is something external happens, a black swan event happens that causes your short triangle to see some fairly substantial losses on one side. But if you kept doing the next month and kept doing it and kept trading the strategy, this is really where the tail risk starts to look substantially better. Um, over a 12 month period, what you start to see is that um, the the best returns substantially outweigh the worst months over a longer period of time. And this is really the, the benefit to this type of strategy over the long run. You know, if you just outright went uh, long equities, many times when you have a bad month or a bad year, it could take quite a few months to get back to break even. This is one of the strategies that they looked at across the board that had some of the fastest recoveries back to break even relative to other longer term investments that you might be able to make. So this is really one of some of the underlying data as to, you know, hopefully help alleviate some of the concerns that retail traders typically have with respect to selling these strategies that have unlimited risk and, and just understand, yes, you are taking substantial risk in the short run, but in the long run, this is the type of strategy that actually shows some of the best returns, some of the best risk-adjusted returns in the overall market. So just to take a look at some of the implied versus realized data, this is from uh, Tastyworks from the Ryan and Beef show. And this shows you the average um, uh, realized volatility versus the expected volatility. And they use the VIX for, to, for, to estimate the 30-day expected volatility, the S&P 500. And then they measure the actual volatility, the S&P 500 over that period. And as you can see, from 2004 to 2017, this is um, 14 years worth of data. What you have is only a single year where the VIX uh, was actually lower than the realized volatility. And that was 2008 during the financial crisis. Uh, outside of that, every single year, uh, the VIX averaged uh, quite a bit higher over the actual realized volatility, which speaks to the efficacy of this strategy over the long run, um, that this is a very, very consistent um, measurement that implied volatility averages higher than realized volatility, which is why, again, this is one of the strategies that are that is most consistent from a professional perspective with, with respect to derivatives. If you look at most derivatives buy side firms, they're leveraging some form of this type of strategy. Obviously very optimized, obviously very specialized, but in some way, shape, or form, it is based on this concept that implied volatility averages a higher level than realized volatility and to try to arbitrage the two. Um, obviously, volatility funds are very, very sophisticated in how they go about doing so, but the underlying concept remains the same. And this is this data set, the one that I'm showing you right now, which is on the S&P 500, uh, we see this across every asset class. We see it across currencies. We see it across commodities. We see it across interest rate. We see it across uh, equity uh, indices. Um, and, and this is something that I think is really important to understand. This is uh, the same um, data set across a higher frequency from 2010 to 2017. So what you have are very sh um, short periods where implied volatility underestimates realized volatility. But as you can see, the vast majority of the data set is, a, is where the implied volatility is higher than the realized volatility. And it probably averages, this is for the S&P 500, averages about 5% higher than the average, maybe 4 to 5% above. So implied volatility ends up on the S&P 500 being on average about 4% higher uh, in the long run over realized volatility. So just further data. And this is some also some back testing that they did um, they also tried to look at uh, selling, you know, uh, 16 Delta Strangles uh, on the S&P 500 from tw tw 2005 to present. And this is what this is some of the optimization that they started to do. They started looking at things like when implied volatility versus realized volatility was higher than normal versus when it's lower than normal. And what you start to see is that one, you have a slightly higher success rate, not a, t not a huge amount of higher success rate, but a little bit. But the profit target was greatly improved when you wait for the implied volatility to be higher than normal relative to realized volatility. And this is that IV rank metric that we were talking about here before. So yes, you can sell strangles all the time and be profitable in the long run, but you can be far more profitable if you are 
uh, if you're a patient and you wait specifically for the right setups from a volatility perspective. And those are some of the things we're going to discuss here today in our trading example. But does this make sense to everyone? Please type five into the chat window if that makes sense to you. <clears throat> Perfect. Okay. So, you know, there's a couple of questions regarding, you know, how, how, how reliable is this data? Well, you know, this is really something that going back 30 years of backtesting, this data has been true um, as far as why this strategy is still the almost entirely the straight trading strategy that volatility buy side funds use. Um, it's because of how consistently implied volatility outpaces realized volatility. Like I said, we can go on quite a bit and try to debate as to why that is the case. And I think there are some um, good arguments for why, but regardless of why, the, the, the fact is that it is true. And you can do the, if, you know, the, the thing about, you know, the, uh, for example, the VIX is that these are publicly available indices that you can pull historical data on. You can calculate your own historical volatility on the S&P 500 if you like, you know, going back 30 days and compare the two and, and see what, what does the VIX average over a year and what does the realized volatility you know, on a 30-day window rolling uh, every single day for, for a year and see um, whether or not in the last five years, last week, last month, these metrics remain. And I can guarantee you that they do because this is the metrics that we do look at. Um, and, I've, and I've recently, um, I, I, I recently actually have done some of this analysis in the last five years or last 10 years rather across equities, currencies, uh, and precious metals. And, and I have some of that data to show, uh, share with you in a short video that I will be publishing soon on this very topic. So let's look at a real example here. And I'm going to use the small US dollar trading, uh, small US dollar futures. And I'm using the small US dollar futures because of a few primary reasons. I think from a trading setup perspective, from a technical perspective, it makes sense as, as far as a timing perspective to look at a more neutral type strategy like a short strangle, but also from a volatility perspective. So what you have here, and, and for those of you that recently watched my webinar on you know, how to trade volatile and choppy markets, one of the things that I, uh, that I expressed was that you know, the best conditions for selling a straddle or strangle are obviously when the markets are moving sideways like this. However, by the time that you've identified the market is moving sideways, most of the time, that's actually the, the worst time to sell a strangle because once a stock, once an, once an asset has been range bound for a while and you've now identified that it's trading in a range, that's when you have a statistical higher likelihood that it's going to break out and make a big move. And that's going to be bad for a straddle that you sell. So if you sold a strangle or a straddle around this area, around this time, because you've identified that the, the underlying has been trading in a range, unfortunately, that's some of the worst times to sell a strangle because that's when you tend to have the, the highest probability of a big breakout or a big move in one direction or another. Vice versa, how do you actually identify when markets are going to move sideways is that they tend to happen after, after an underlying makes a big move. Because something has happened to fundamentally change, uh, you know, the, the, the direction or the trend of an underlying. And usually after a big move, after something external that forces the underlying to, to rapidly change in terms of pricing, there's usually a period of consolidation afterwards. And most of you are familiar with this. Think about you know, Netflix or Amazon or any of the stocks that after a big run, you know, after a four or 500% change in the underlying stock price, what you have is a period, sometimes of months, sometimes years of where it just sits in a range and, and the market is effectively digesting everything that has happened in terms of the shift of the underlying security. And it spends that time trading in a range. So what we the reason I'm using the US dollar is because we've recently had this very big move here from uh, 150 up to that 162 range, and it's pulled back a little bit, about four bucks or so. And I think that this is, you know, at least a good shot of potentially 
uh, performing a bit of a consolidation, which is typically what happens after a big move. So first, I have a directional view uh, in terms of now from a timing perspective, could be a good time to look at more neutral strategies. And number two, the implied volatility of, of the U.S. Uh, of the small U.S. dollar right now is 52 percent, which is greater than the 50 percent threshold that we typically use for looking at these types of option selling strategies. And one other thing that I just add to this is statistical uh, measure, which is the average true range. As you can see, the, this bottom indicator here, which you might not be able to see very clearly, but this bottom indicator, as you can see, the average true range of the uh, U.S. dollars, usually about 50 cents here or so, but recently it's nearly double that at 99 cents. So, you know, usually this this is an indicator that that's telling me that the, that the underlying has made a big outsized move compared to its own history. And again, that increases the probability that you see more of that sideways uh, consolidation motion rather than a continuation higher. Does that make sense to everyone? Please type six into the chat window if that makes sense to you as to why we have kind of the conditions that we typically look for to take a more neutral short volatility strategy. It's the directional view that I have after a big move and the elevated implied volatility that we currently see here in the US dollar. Okay, so I see a lot of sixes. So let's start taking a look at an option strategy. So here, what I'm gonna look at is the June expiration, which is roughly 22 days from expiration. This is the front month expiration. And I'm selling the 155, 161 strangle. And the way I chose these strike prices is the 156 puts uh, is a 19, uh, I'm sorry, is a uh, 14 delta. So this is the strike that's closest to um, the uh, the 16 delta or the one standard deviation move. Um, and then the 161 calls, uh, which is uh, in this particular case, uh, a 21 delta, also the closest that I have for the uh, 16 deltas. And also if you're using a platform like Tastyworks, they have a very... Uh, they have a very handy indicator here on the options chain. As you can see, there's these dashed lines here that tells me this is where the one standard deviation move is. So I can easily eyeball the 156, uh, 161 when I'm selling a strangle here uh, to know those are the strike prices to choose. And they even have an indicator for the two standard deviation move. So as you can see the dashed lines here, this refers to the two standard deviation move. So I can quickly eyeball where I can, you know, uh, just pick my strike prices if I'm choosing a one standard deviation move. In this particular case, the 156, 161. And as you can see, this currently will collect 50 cents in premium. Selling a 22 day 16 delta strangle will collect 50 cents in premium. Now, this is really where it gets interesting from a margin perspective on options on futures. Because keep in mind, the US dollar is something that doesn't move very much. It do, it's not a very volatile security. It's not an, it's not an underlying that makes big moves uh, compared to equities, compared to some of the other asset classes that you might be used to trading, especially in this market environment where we see stocks make 20, 30% jumps in a single day. That doesn't happen to the US dollar. So what is, is, what's interesting about selling the strangle here is that you look at the margin requirement to sell a single uh, contract is only $110. So I'm collecting $50 in premium to sell one contract and it only requires $110 in margin to do so because again, the US dollar doesn't move that much. So the margin on this type of product is substantially lower. And that's the benefit of trading options on futures is that the margin requirement is based on the volatility of the underlying, the less volatile the, the the less volatile the underlying, the less margin that I have to put up to place this trade. So if I'm going to collect $50 in premium while putting up $110 in margin, that is a static return of 45% in just 22 days. That's not 45% annualized. That's 45% over 22 days. If you annualize that, and, and I'm not suggesting that you annualize a 22-day return, but if you did, it is a very, very astronomically high number. And this is why this is one of the strategies that, you know, professional buy side volatility funds tend to trade is these types of short strangle trades when implied volatility is elevated 
And you can maximize profitability if you also at the same time add some type of directional edge. You know, when when you have a big move that you tend to have a statistical edge as to when that um, asset or underlying will tend to move sideways, which is again, the ideal conditions for selling a, a, a strangle like the strategy that we're discussing here today. And this is profitable as long as, uh, you know, the, the underlying security stays between 155 and a half and 161 and a half. This is a strategy, like I said, that has unlimited risk. And this is, again, one of the reasons why I see a lot of retail traders will stay away from this type of strategy because it truly has unlimited risk. But you really have to consider the fact that if you're collecting 50 cents in credit, right, or $50 in credit, uh, you know, the stock, uh, the underlying in this particular case has to move down to about 155 or 162 in order for this, uh, uh, for this, um, strategy to lose $50. Remember, your potential reward on this is $50 a contract, but it has to move to 155 or 162 before you lose $50. So, you know, your risk is technically unlimited, but in order for it to be unlimited, you have to move substantially higher than that, right? So, you know, if the stock, if the underlying moved to 163, you're taking on a dollar fifty worth of risk or $150 worth of risk for, uh, you know, for this $50 worth of reward. And this is really where you have to, you know, you do take on that risk, right? So if there's some type of external event, uh, I don't know, the Fed decides to be far more hawkish or, or chooses to slow down their interest rate um, hikes, those are the types of moves that can cause the US dollar to make a big outsized move in the short run. But again, this is that will also that will also at the same time elevate implied volatility even further, which gives you even a, a higher premium to sell the next month to offset some of the losses that you collect this month uh, or that you might find yourself in this month. Um, and I know that that may not be um, enough for most investors to say, okay, let me go ahead and place that trade. But this is some of the data sets that I'm hopefully showing you to encourage and help you explore more about these types of strategies that you may, you know, write off immediately because of the fact that it has unlimited risk. Um, so next, what I want to talk about is some of the adjustments that you might be able to make, if you will, to potentially increase your potential profits a little bit. So for example, before I was showing you the fact that we were trading, you know, we had this big move here to the upside. We've retraced $4 or so. Maybe you think that we're near the bottom end of the range that so we're going to trade somewhere between 158 and 162, right? And that's a reasonable, I would say, assumption that you might be able to make from an adjust, from a technical perspective or from a directional perspective. And that's really where what you can do is you can get a little bit more um, premium, if you let's say you sold the 157, so you used a higher delta strike price because you feel that we're near the bottom of the range. Instead of selling the 156, you adjust it to a 157. And making that slight adjustment, what you've done here is you're now collecting $68 of, of premium per contract while increasing your margin requirement by about $10 or so. So you're collecting $18 more in premium, but only have to post about $10 more in margin requirements. So your static return now here increases to 57% from what was 45% before. So if you make a slight directional bet, if you will, on this type of strangle, you can start to increase your potential reward. And now this is profitable between 156.32 and 161.68. So you're raising the bottom end of the range as to when you're profitable. You're adjusting it a little higher on the upper side, but you are still taking on unlimited risk for this particular strategy. But those are some of the adjustments that you can make that will generate a little bit more premium that can help offset a little bit more in terms of downside if, this, if, the, if the underlying does make a big move. Does that make sense to everyone? Please type seven into the chat window if that makes sense to you. Perfect, okay. Now, lastly, like I said, not everyone is comfortable taking on that unlimited risk. So let's talk about a strategy that you could potentially start with as perhaps a beginner where you're not comfortable taking on all of that risk, but you still want to take advantage of this type of strategy is you can turn the strangle into an iron condor. So here, what I'm still going to do is I'm going to sell the 157, 160 strangle, but then I'm going to buy the 156 and buy the 162 calls and puts against it. And that's going to offset the overall risk. 
And what this does is it now it greatly decreases the amount of premium that I collect down to just 31 cents or $31 a contract. But it also significantly reduces the margin requirement on this particular trade because now I have limited risk. And now my margin requirement is only $32. And this actually increases your static return to $96. I'm sorry, 96%. And this is profitable as long as this is between 156 and 161 with a max risk of now only $69 a contract versus the unlimited risk that you take with a short strangle. So those are some of the adjustments that you could potentially make as a retail trader if you're not comfortable taking on the unlimited risk of a short strangle, but you still want to take advantage of this volatility risk premium that I referred to here today. So with that, what I'll, um, that covers what I wanted to share with you here today with respect to this particular strategy. Now, I'm going to take a break and I'll be right back here and I'll come back and we'll discuss some of the advantages to trading these small futures. I'll be back here in one second. Okay, and I'm back. So what I want to just wrap this up the session with is just an understanding of the small exchange and the standardization that they have now applied to options on futures that we didn't have prior to the small exchange. Because if you're trading options on futures, there were a lot of new things that you had to learn if you were coming from the equity options world. You had to learn about the different multipliers for each contract. Unlike stocks and options where everything is 100 shares, it's easy to, to, to understand regardless of what equity or what ETF you're trading, it's always 400 shares. The small exchanges apply to 100 multiplier across all of their futures contracts when it comes to options. So you have an easier time transitioning as opposed to traditional futures. You have all different types of crazy multipliers and you have to learn them for each product that you trade. It's like every single stock that you trade, you have to learn how many shares each contract controls. It's much harder to, to get started with those types of contracts. Traditional futures also expire on all different times of the month. So if you're trading, imagine if you're trading an Apple contracts and they expire on the third Friday and Google expires on the second Friday and Facebook expires on the first Friday. And you have to remember that across the board. Small exchange offers third Friday, the same monthly expiration that you are used to as an equity investor across all of their products. And they're all $1 tick sizes. So easier transition, I think, coming from an equity uh, stock or ETF investor to trading options on futures and taking advantage of the margin uh, advantages that you have here when you're trading uh, options on futures. Uh, they have it across multiple assets in terms of interest rates, oil, cannabis, cryptocurrency, precious metals, the yield uh, products, I think, is some of the most innovative products and equity indices. In terms of options on futures currently today, you have them available on the US dollar and precious metals. I use the US dollar because it happens to really align with all of the uh, underlying um, requirements that I see are necessary to short a strangle, which is a directional view and a volatility view. Um, but you know there are going to be more of these that are going to have options on futures listed in the future. But the US dollar and the precious metals are the two that you can trade options on futures on. The rest of these products, you can trade the futures 
uh, products themselves. And I've done a lot of education this year in 2022 on, op on just futures trading in general. So if you want to learn more about that, please check out some of those videos if you are new to trading futures uh, before you start trading options on futures. And if you're looking to get started with some of the strategies that we discussed here today, you can open up an account either at Tastyworks or IBKR to open up your trading account in order to trade these options on futures. Just make sure you enable your futures account when you do open those accounts. Um, we do have a link for you to open your Tastyworks account by clicking on this link here on your screen, which I will post into the chat window. Uh, this is a uh, way to get started with your Tastyworks account if you are looking to utilize the platform I just showed you here today to, um, to trade these types of strategies. And also one thing that I do wanna announce is that we are now providing futures trading signal. So this FF, SFX trading signal, the short strangle trade is actually one that we are sending out. So in order to get yourself on the list to receive these trading signals, please sign up using optionsplay.com slash trade, trade dash futures. Uh, we are sending out multiple trade signals a week on these types of futures products as well as options on futures. Um, and you can do so um, by signing up using the link here on your screen. This is provided by me and the research team in conjunction with the small exchange to provide ideas with exact entry and exit points based on the best practices that we teach, such as the one in this webinar here today. Um, so you can get access to some of these trading signals doing that by clicking on that link or using uh, that link. And lastly, if you, are in, if you are trading these futures products or options on futures products, you can get a 50% discount on trading fees. So instead of paying 15 cents per contract, you can reduce that to just seven cents a contract by buying one purchase of a lifetime membership for the community membership here at the small exchange. Normally it's $100, but we have an exclusive options play discount for 50% off. So for $50, you can buy a lifetime community membership to the small exchange that's going to give you 50% off of your trading fees. And you can sign up at trade.optionsplay.com slash small 50 off. And I also posted that link here into the chat window here as well. So a link to open your Tastyworks account, a link to uh, sign up for trading, uh, trading signals, and a link to get your community membership, which is a 50% discount off of trading fees. And this is just for a one-time payment of $50. That's lifetime in terms of your trading fee discounts. You also get the weekly newsletter, which has some benefits and some stats that are really important for those of you trading some more statistical-based strategies, which is, a, which is a strategy I covered two months ago. And you can find out a little bit more about that by watching either the short video or the long format webinar, depending on whether you want the Cliff Notes version or the full version. And you get some limited uh, merchandise from the small exchange here as well. Um, so that's all included in your $50 membership. And again, this is an exclusive Options Play discount that you can only get through Options Play using that link. If you went directly to the small exchange website, you would pay $100 for the same community membership. So with that, let's open this up for Q&A. Um, just out of curiosity, which link is not working? If you don't mind letting me know, I'm happy to try to help troubleshoot that. Um, but in the meantime, let's open this up for Q&A. Any questions regarding trading options on futures, any questions regarding volatility risk premium or any of the data sets that we discussed here today, please type your questions in the Q&A window and I'll try to answer your questions as much as possible. Um, so what will, yes, uh, you know, the correlation between sticks and S, uh, SM75, I would say that you, those are the most highly correlated ones, but they're not meant to mimic those if, if that's your question. Um, they're kind of their own in, indices on their own. You know, market profile, even TradingView has a pretty good market profile feature now. You know, I use Thinkorswim, but, um, uh, you know, a lot of charting packages now have market profile built in, even options play. Uh, so options, options on futures can be traded whenever futures markets are open. Uh, generally speaking, yes. Um, it depends on the options, uh, you know, the futures market or, or the uh, specific futures market, but at least for the small exchange, uh, as long as the futures are trading, the options are trading. 
Well, span margin change daily. Span margin changes, it can train, train, cha- can change daily. They generally don't cha- change much from day to day, but they can change daily, yes. Can we limit risk on selling options by spreads? And the answer is yes, and that's what I covered in my last slide, which is you know trading the iron condor, right? So you're still selling the strangle, but then you're buying the out of the money wings and that offsets the risk. And it greatly reduces the amount of risk It also greatly reduces the amount of premium you collect, but it also reduces the amount of margin requirement uh, required on the credits, on the on the um, on the uh, spread itself. So yes, are you going to cover how very fast moving a stock price can hurt and how to mitigate and when to get out? So Ron, you know the. the, My point here is that you can't mitigate when things move really fast, right? Um, you, uh, well, sorry, you can mitigate by using an iron condor, right, which protects you from on both sides. Um, you know, as far as when to get out, you know, usually you, you want to set some form of a max pain. So if you exceed more than 100% of the premium that you've collected on a short strangle, it's time to get out. Um, but, you know, a lot of what I see a lot of traders do is when they get burned on a short strangle, they stop selling, they stop trading that. Um, but you know the data clearly shows is that the best way to recover is to continue to trade that strategy, especially when you got that when you have that big move. What that does is it causes a spike in an implied volatility, and that is actually a better time to continue to sell strangles and and help get yourself back to recovery fairly quickly. And the data clearly backs that up. That short strangle type strategies has has some of the fastest recoveries back to break even versus most other long-term buy and hold uh, investment um, strategies. So, you know, what, when we see most retail traders exit this strategy is actually when we see most institutional traders step into this particular strategy because they're not necessarily um, not hurt by it, but, but what they do is they know how to get back to break even from it. And I think that's truly what makes the difference between a retail and institutional customer for the most part. And a lot of retail traders get burned, sometimes burned too, too badly that they can't step in because they don't have enough capital to get in. And that's really kind of what's different, I think, between an institutional investor and a, and a retail investor is that the institutional investor priced or sorry, size their position correctly to begin with. So even when a, when a trade goes against them, even in, in, when there's a big move against them, you know they're they're they still they're still well capitalized to continue trading that strategy the next the following month, and they can get themselves back to break even. Versus a lot of retail traders I see might size their trades incorrectly and blow up thirty percent of their account, you know, on a bad month. And find themselves not having enough capital to continue trading that strategy. When in reality, that's really kind of what differentiates a professional from from a retail is that they're well capitalized even in a bad month and they can continue to trade that strategy and actually get themselves back to break even far faster. So hopefully that kind of helps answer your question, uh, Ron. Jay, can you show an example on Apple? Um, I I can, but I I really prefer to focus you know my our attentions here on on uh, options on futures. But you can set the same thing up on Apple. You know, Apple currently, I believe the IV rank is above fifty. Let's take a look. Yeah, it's sixty seven point two. So you know, you have a very similar setup to the U.S. dollar, if not inverse, right? So basically, you've had a big move here to the downside. We're starting to see a bit of of movement to the upside, perhaps now is when you start to see a bit of consolidation here for Apple. Um, And and maybe you might want to sell a strangle where you're closer to the bottom end, and then you find something in the, you know, 150 range, 155 range, the upside, uh, just for a quick, quick example. What's the number of days for calculating a realized versus historical volatility? So, you know, you want to use what what implied volatility you're looking at, right? So if you're looking at 30-day implied volatility, then you want to use 30 days to calculate historical volatility. If you're using IV, if you're looking at, let's say, 90-day implied volatility, then you want to use 90 days of realized volatility. So you always want to match the implied volatility to uh, the historical volatility that you're looking at in terms of time frame. 
what amount are you at risk with a small dollar strangle? You have unlimited risk, right? Because technically you are you have unlimited risk on both sides. But obviously the market can only move to one side. So what you're doing is you're taking on risk uh, it, and it's unlimited, right? So it's kind of like being long or short the stock. Uh, you know, you're basically long and short the stock at the same time. And basically if the stock starts to go against you or the equity starts to, or the underlying starts to go against you, it's dollar for dollar loss, you know, in the opposite direction. When should a strangle be closed? Generally speaking, you know, you set yourself a max pain level, such as 100% of the premium that you collect. So if you're collecting $50, as soon as you lose $50 on the strangle, that's when you want to cut your losses. And, you know, part of the reasons why I think also doing this on futures makes sense is because, you know, futures, uh, you know, any, any, um, uh, any of these specific products that are listed here uh, that you can trade uh, futures on or, uh, or, you know, the ones that you can trade options on futures on, which are dollar and precious metals, is that these are assets that can't, you know, that generally speaking, don't see huge gaps uh, in a single day, right? So it's not like... Uh, target that can be down 25% in a single day or John Deere that's down 15% in a day on some bad news. The US dollar and gold just simply doesn't do that. You know, you have, you know, bad months where you can have like this, the underlying move quite a bit in a, in a, in a, in a month period, but you don't have daily gaps where the market will gap 20% lower, right? So it reduces this quote unquote single stock risk that you have when you're selling strangles on something more diversified and something more broad, like the dollar or gold um, or precious metals rather, because it's not even just gold, it's gold, silver, and platinum in this particular case. So you have even further di diversification there. So diversity Diversification helps prevent these kind of overnight 10, 20, 30% gaps that you have if you were selling a strangle on an individual stock. So options on futures kind of protects you from that single stock risk when you're selling strangles. So you tend to find that if you there is a gap overnight, they're relatively small and you're going to be able to close out your trade near your max pain level versus if you sold a strangle on target and the stock opens up 25% lower, you may not get anywhere close to being able to close out your trade at your target stop loss level, if you will. Is SFX an example you gave a small exchange option? Yes, these are small exchange options that I was referring to here today. Um, and yes, the commission cost for SFX options is the 15 cents per contract um, and the lifetime membership. Uh, I'm sorry, there's a commission for trading futures, but the the, the transaction cost per, per contract is what you get a discount on. And the lifetime membership is for uh, the cheaper fees on trading um, these products. Since we have we've had higher sustained IV this year, hasn't hasn't that created more outlier moves for equities and more risk when selling strangles? Um, Wayne, yes, there's more risk for selling strangles in this market, but you're also getting paid to take on that risk, right? So when VIX is at 30, you're getting paid double the premium than when VIX is at 15. So what you're doing is you're getting paid more premium to assume a higher level of risk. Uh, so yes, the risk is higher, but you're getting rewarded for that higher risk. And what we're saying is that the reward is always going to be slightly higher than what the actual risk that you're taking, because the realized volatility is the actual risk that you're taking. The implied volatility is what you're getting paid to take on that risk. And what you're getting paid is always slightly higher than what you think of it like an insurance uh, insurance company, right? Insurance company is always going to charge more in terms of premiums that they charge you versus what they believe they have to pay out on the at the end of the year. So think of realized volatility as kind of like the risk that you're taking in terms of what you might have to pay out for, for, for taking on that risk. And the implied volatility is the premium that you're collecting to assume that risk. And what we're showing you is the data is showing you that the premium that you're that you are collecting is going to be slightly greater than the risk that you're actually taking. I think that's perhaps a better way to explain the volatility risk premium in a more layman's term. Uh, yes, there are typically trading commissions in addition to the 15 cents per contract or seven cents per contract fee, uh, you know, depending on your brokerage firm. 
what is max pain? Max pain is just your stop loss level. Well, at what point do you say, I am out, I, can't, I don't want to take on any more risk and I want to get out. And I'm saying that you generally, for a strangle, might want to set your stop loss level at what the, the 100% of the premium that you collect. So if you collect $50 on a strangle, you set your stop loss where if you lost $50 per contract on that trade, you get out of the trade. Um, I missed the last session on futures. So Sanjay, you know, you can always find us on YouTube, option, youtube.com slash options play. And it is posted on that, on our channel there. Uh, we have a whole series on futures trading and, and options on futures. You can find us on our YouTube channel. Um, and Philip, if you don't mind, if you could just send Sanjay a link um, and just send that out to everyone, uh, hopefully that'll also uh, point you in the right direction. How do, a great question from David. How does assignment risk figure into when closing a strangle? So this is really another benefit of, of options on futures is that they are cash settled. So you don't have exercise and assignment risk. Um, so you've eliminated that entirely by trading options on futures. It's kind of like trading an index option from that perspective. So uh, it is also another advantage, in my opinion, to trading options on futures. So if, let's say you're trying to sell a strangle on GLD versus selling a strangle on small precious metals. You know, when you're selling a strangle on GLD, you have assignment and exercise risk. When you're doing it on the small futures, you don't have that. So at expiration, whatever profits and losses you have are settled in cash into your account. and You never have to worry about closing a strangle because of exercise or assignment. So great question, David, and, and, and I'm glad that you asked that question. Um, Daniel, you're, as far as trading commissions, the best person to ask is your brokerage firm. They will be able to point you to what your commission schedules are for trading futures. Um, I'll be honest, I don't know of how you trade small exchange products in Canada. Um, perhaps uh, someone from the small exchange can jump in and answer that question, but I don't believe at the moment that you can trade these products in Canada, but I'm happy to be proven wrong on that. Any other questions? If there are no other questions, I just want to thank everyone for taking the time out here this afternoon. I really hope that this was helpful and illuminating in terms of just one, the volatility risk premium. This is the reason why institutions prefer selling options versus buying options. So even if you're an options trader in general, you learn something from that perspective. And I hope that also for those of you that are not currently trading options on futures, you know, when you're thinking about selling premium on certain products that you might want to consider doing it on options on futures versus options on ETFs because of the margining process that's available to you, the efficiencies that you get, and also the lack of, of exercise and assignment risk that you have with options on futures, not to mention no pattern day trading rules and a taxable advantage on these types of products. And, you know, when you're thinking about UUP, for example, you know, that's the US dollar ETF, uh, you're thinking about trading that perhaps you might want to look at futures because of the advantages that you get here. With that, thank you so much. We'll send out both the recording and the slides to you after we finish here today. Um, and please, as always, I hope you guys have a great trading day.